Have you ever considered who or what influences your life and the habits that you allow those things to come around and influence you? In May of 2005, David Foster Wallace gave an electric and instantly famous graduation address at Kenyon College, and he called it, This is Water. And he started it off with this narrative. There are two young fish swimming along, and they happen to meet an older fish swimming the other way, who nods at them and says, morning, boys, how's the water? And the two young fish swim on for a bit, and then eventually one of them looks over at the other and goes, what the heck is water? And while we laugh at that because these fish are living in water, the point that Wallace is making here is that the most obvious and important realities are often the ones that are hardest for us to see and even talk about. And for us, a lot of those habits, the waters uh, that are forming our lives, are our habits. And these become often the primary influence in our lives. We are, all of us are living life according to a specific regimen of habits, and these habits shape most of our lives. Now, before I get too much further on, I want to define what I mean by habits so that you're not assuming what I know what I'm talking about, or I'm not assuming that you know exactly what I'm talking about. So a habit is a behavior that occurs automatically over and over and is often unconsciously. So chances are when you get up on Tuesday to go to work, you don't have to actively think about where you are driving because you are almost on autopilot because you take that such a routine time as you go to work. There was a study done from Duke University that suggests that as much as 40% of the actions we take every day are not product of choices, but of habits. Which is crazy when you think about almost half of the things that happen to us are not an act of choice that we are making, but they're just things that we happen to have already in our routine. Now, just because we don't choose our habits doesn't mean that we don't have them. The opposite is true. It usually means that someone else chooses them for us, and usually that someone doesn't have our best interest in mind, and these become the primary influences in our life. So when we look at our work schedule, when we look at our social media feed, when we look at our internet browser history, when we look at the overview of our year in Spotify, these things often define the mass majority of our lives. And it wouldn't be such a problem, but the reality is, is when it forms the habit of our life, it also forms and shapes our heart, which forms and shapes our affections, our desires, our time, and what we worship. And so what I want to do this morning is talk about how God's word needs to be the primary influence in all of these areas. That we need to filter our lives and the primary habit, the spiritual rhythms that we have needs to have God's word at the center as we kick off this new year. Because as we kick this new year off, as we get this started, there are two formations that are so essential to us persevering and enduring in our walk with Christ. It's gathering with God's people weekly, and it's individually opening God's word personally that we begin to understand that. In a book called Transformational Discipleship, Geisler talks about this idea, Eric Geisler, that these two formations, these two spiritual rhythms, these two habits are essential to the health of individuals continuing to seek and follow Jesus that we gather together weekly on a Sunday, we worship together, we take in God's word, and we individually prioritize the influence of God's word in our life. And so we're gonna unpack this this morning in Psalm 1, verses one through three. If you're not already there, you can turn there uh, in your Bible. And he starts off with this, blessed is the man. He kicks off this whole book, it's 150 different Psalms, and he kicks it off with blessed is the man. Now, this idea of blessing means to be happy, uh, and this is not something that you can earn or that even we deserve as a whole, but it is a gift from God given to those who are enjoying their relationship with him. And so if we want to enjoy our relationship with him, he's going to talk about three negative influences that we want to avoid and two positive uh, influences that we want to bring into our life. 
And so let's look at these three negative influences uh, seen in verse one that we want to bring into our life that we may experience the blessing of God and enjoy our relationship with him. The first one is this. We should not walk, walk in the counsel of the wicked. We should not walk in the counsel of the wicked. A wicked person is somebody who's doing evil towards God or towards God's people. Uh, They're guilty for this. And when you walk in their way, you are beginning to allow them to come into your life and you are allowing them to become an influence and somebody you confide in, right? He talks about the counsel. So there's, there's somebody that you start to turn to when your marriage is struggling, There's someone you start turning to when you're not sure how to parent or navigate this difficulty of raising kids. It begins to be somebody that you start confiding in for how to deal with the difficulties at work, and they become your counselor. Now, it's not that they don't have wisdom, and it's not that they don't have experience that they can't share with you, but they have a different foundation than you or I do, because they don't have the spirit of Christ, they don't have a relationship with Christ, and they don't have the foundation values of God's word, and so Sometimes their counsel is going to pull you away from God. And here, this is a negative influence that you and I should avoid. The second one, he says, is nor stand in the way of sinners. This is the second uh, negative influence that we want to avoid in our life. We don't want to stand in the way of sinners. Now, these don't be people that we occasionally confide in. These are people that become the driving influence of our life that we're going through life, we're headed in the same way, the same direction with them. And they're willfully disobeying God's word, and yet we're not participating in it. We're just an innocent bystander, so we think that somehow we can just get away with it. But the reality is, is in verses four and five, it talks about their end is judgment. So if that's the direction that they're heading, why do we want to be innocent bystanders just watching them go through it because we don't want to be alone or we don't want to be uh, by ourselves? And so we just willfully just allow that to take place. And this is a negative influence in our life. Uh, The next one, number three, he says, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. These are people that mock God's word. They're people who mock God's people. And now we're starting to join in with them. Now, scoffer is not something that we use commonly today, but this was an example that happened in Jesus' life. That at the end of Jesus' life, as he's headed towards the cross, they begin to hit him in the back of the head, knock him on the ground, and say, if you truly are God and you know all things, then tell us who hits you. They're mocking him. They're scoffing at him. They literally, after they've flogged him and they've beaten him, they've put a crown of thorns onto the top of his head, and they mock him as the king of the Jews. They throw a robe of purple over him, symbolizing royalty, making fun of his kingship that was meant to be over their lives. This was the progression that started taking place. And this is the people that he says that we should avoid and we should not take counsel in. But notice the progression of this influence in this passage. He talks about walking and then standing and then sitting. It continues to get more intense. The intensity builds. Uh, The climax starts building. I love what one commentator says about this. If you follow the wrong counsel, then you will stand in the wrong companion and finally sit with the wrong crowd. That's what erosion begins to happen. That's where it's like, well, I'm just going to confide in them a little bit here, and then I'm going to join in their way. And then eventually, how do we even get to the point where we're literally mocking God and mocking God's people, and we're just in the middle of this? where how do, we, how do we become people that live in a culture that doesn't agree with what we believe in, that it's opposed to it, but how do we still send our kids to school? How do we still uh, live in our neighborhoods? How do we still go to work and a lot allow this erosion to take place? Because this erosion can take place so quickly, and it happened in Lot's life. Lot was an Old Testament uh, man that was related to Abraham, And their family units were getting to become so great and so big. And it was at that moment that they began to divide up land so that they could spread out their livestock. And what it says in Genesis chapter 13 and 14 is it says that first, uh, Lot looked towards Sodom. Chapter 13, verse 10, it says he looked towards Sodom. He desired it. He lusts after it. He wanted to be there. Now, Sodom was not this magnificent place that you wanted to be. It was full of wickedness and evil. And then a couple verses later, it says he pitches his tent towards Sodom. That he's now studying the culture. He wants to be a part of that culture. He desires it. And then in chapter 14, it says that he moved into Sodom. 
He's like in the gates. He's a, it's a midst of the life and the culture and Abraham has to go rescue him out of it. That's what happens when you walk, you stand, you sit. That's where erosion begins to take place. That's where you begin to look like culture and not live in the midst of culture and represent Christ. So how do we do this? How do we not allow erosion to take place? Because we still have to send our kids to school. We still have to go to work. We still have to live in our neighborhoods. There are two examples seen in scriptures, one in the Old Testament and one in the New Testament that shows us how we don't fall into the trap that Lot did. One, Daniel and his friends were in Babylon. Babylon was a foreign land, worshiping foreign gods, and the nation of Israel was brought in, and so Daniel and his friends are there. And the way that he and his friends insisted that they would serve in Babylon's courts, but they would look completely different than them in the patterns of life that they would develop. It was their commitment to specific habits of different types of eating, different types of drinking, different types of Uh, commitments towards one another that allowed them and living and praying that allowed them to live in the world, but not of the world. You see, another example also is laid out in the New Testament in Acts chapter two, where we see a very similar idea. And it was these early Christians were devoting themselves to four things, God's word, God's people, to prayer and communion that allowed them to be in the world, but not of the world. And it was the distinctiveness of these habits that set them apart, called them to a commitment of their faith, and attracted many others to join them. So what we begin to see in these two examples is what Daniel and his friends saw in Babylon, and the early disciples of Christ saw in Acts chapter 2 in Rome, is they saw with very clear eyes that the Babylonians and the Romans were completely blind to seeing who God truly was, and these people's lives were ordered around the love of self, the love of power, the love of riches, and the love of sex. And they devoted themselves to different habits so that their perspective didn't look suspiciously like we would see America to be. Because we are no different in America than the Babylonians or to the early Romans that were taking place in the first century, we can look just like them. But we devote ourselves to specific habits, specific formations that help form and shape our relationship so that we can live in the midst of culture, be different than culture, and still represent Christ in the culture. And there are some specific things that we can pull from Psalm 1 that help us to be like Daniel and his friends and to be like the early disciples of Acts chapter 2. So here are two positive influences that we want to adopt, that we want to be a part of our life. In uh, Psalm 1, verse 2, it says this, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. The first positive influence we want to have in our life is we want to delight in God's word. We want to make it a weekly practice because it des- we desire God's word. It matters to us. We take pleasure in God's word. Jeremiah fifteen sixteen says this, Your words were found and I ate them and your words became to me a joy and the delight of my heart. It was something they desired. It was something that he uh, wanted to be a part of. Now, chances are for many of us here, we um, ate a lot in the last month. (laughs) Way too many treats, way too many high calorie drinks, uh, way too much fatty food. And our problem is not that we ate too much. Our problem now is that we're not feeding our spiritual souls. That, uh, God's word says in Matthew chapter four, Jesus says this, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. That it's not just enough to fill our stomachs with food. We have to fill our souls with the nutrients of God's word and make that a daily habit, a weekly uh, habit to come into this place and allow God's word to begin to take place and do this. And the reality becomes that I think too many of us have too many Bible access. Like we have audio Bibles. We have three or four Bibles sitting on our shelves. Uh, We have all of these resources, podcasts, all this kind of stuff. And part of the reason we're struggling to lighten God's word is because it's becoming so mundane in our life. But it needs to be something that like we desire, we delight in, we cherish. 
And on one of my trips over to Burkina Faso, West Africa, one of the things we were doing was we would go into a church, we would begin to teach the Bible, and at the end of it, we had already had their pastor screen who could read but didn't own a Bible. In a highly illiterate culture where finances were a major struggle, owning a Bible was a cherished possession. It was something that people didn't have a lot of. And so we would go into these churches, we would teach the Bible, and at the end of it, we would have a Bible either in their native language, more or in the colonized language, French, depending upon what they spoke, and we would hand out these Bibles. And we were able to capture a picture that I want to show you of a girl owning her first Bible. I think they have it here for us. Maybe. Just a second. Nope. Sorry. They don't have it. It is a teenage girl getting her first Bible. And she has this exuberating big smile on her face. The Bible is literally sitting next to her. And she is so excited to be able to own her first Bible. Like that's what it means to delight in God's word. That's what it means to have great joy in understanding what it's like to have God's word. Now, for many of us, we don't struggle to not own a Bible. For many of us, we don't. Uh, we have lots of them. Um, we can read them. We can listen to podcasts on them. Uh, that is not the issue. And so we need to delight in God's word and cherish that. So here's like four practical, really simple things that could help you delight in God's word uh, a little bit more in this new year. You could read less or you could read more. For some of you, uh, you've read the verse of the day on you version, or you just randomly open up the Bible and you read a verse, uh, but that's not enough. You've got to do more than that. Start reading a chapter, two, three, four chapters. You start hitting three, four chapters a day, you're going to get through the whole Bible in a year, and you're going to have a greater understanding of God's overall plan of redemption, and you're going to understand it to a greater degree. For others of you, you've been reading through the Bible uh, in a year, year after year, all the way through, and maybe this year you need to take smaller chunks, half chapter, a full chapter, and just really let it soak in. It's something you think about, meditate on, and understand some of the details of God's plan of redemption to a greater degree. For others of you, uh, we could do use resources. We are growing up in a day and age that have so many resources from podcasts, to audio Bibles, to commentaries, to study Bibles. You can utilize those and it will help you delight in God's word. Let's just take, uh, sometimes people tell me I don't have time in my day to read the Bible. What if you turned off the podcast or turned off the radio and you turned on the audio Bible on your commute to and from work? That's a really simple way that you can get through a couple of chapters and get your heart right. Or you're sitting down to eat your breakfast in the morning and as you're reading, as you're eating your food, you have the audio Bible playing so you can hear it and you have it, you can see it as it scrolls down through there. That's where you begin to apply what Matthew 4.4, 4, Jesus said, man should not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Start using some of the commentaries. There's free ones all over. ESV.org has them. Pick up a study Bible, an ESV, where it gives you an introduction, study Bible, where it gives you an introduction into that book, and then there's commentary at the bottom of it, so you can understand some of the truths that are talked about there, and it begins to increase your appetite for God's word uh, in a greater degree. Another one, you could pray for a desire. It says, help me to hunger and thirst for righteousness, he says in one spot. So like, what if we started praying, God, give me a hunger to spend time in your word. Help me to delight in your, God, uh, your word. Help me to, to desire it. Make sure that it's a, a priority and something we, we desire to be in there. And the truth is, is that the longer we're away from God's word, the more that desire disappears. But the longer we spend time in God's word, the more that desire grows. So if you've never made that a practice of your life, start with this desire because we're going to cast this desire in you today and then allow and feed that and fuel that flame that that desire continues to grow so you can understand that. Or maybe you got out of the rhythm of it after the last couple of years and this begins to need to have a rhythm and reestablish that rhythm that this is a daily thing that you do uh, in your individual life. Number four, another real practical one, obey it. Obey it. Our delight starts with knowing God's word, studying God's word and memorizing it, 
but it climaxes in our obedience to God's word. You see, it's not just enough that as you begin to read it, as you begin to understand it, as you begin to gather and take it in on a Sunday, that God is going to, by his spirit, convict you of ways that your life doesn't line up with his truth or his, uh, your plans and purposes aren't gonna align with his and he's going to convict you of those things and it's going to cause you to wanna realign your life. It's gonna cause you to confess and come clean with those things and allow that to take place in your life. Because when you begin to do that, I guarantee you, you may wrestle with it. You may struggle with it. And I can honestly say every time I've wrestled with God's word and wrestled with the spirit of God calling me to give it up, when I finally do and I surrender it, there is great peace in my soul. And I look back six months, year, two years later, and I am so glad that finally I would surrender to the spirit of God and that there was great growth that happened there. So this is where it climaxes here. And if you're still struggling, you are not made to grow in your relationship with Jesus on your own. It is not a solo sport. It is a team sport to follow God. And so I want to encourage you to sign up for discipleship. Discipleship is a ministry we offer here where we're training young followers of Jesus to know and obey God's word. And when we say young, that doesn't mean young in age. Uh, You could be 50, 40, 60, uh, or even 20, and helping you navigate and how to develop some of these rhythms, these habits to help form and shape your relationship with Jesus. I was recently meeting with a guy, and he said, I want to sign up for discipleship because I feel like my relationship with Christ is a roller coaster. And what I've heard is discipleship helps bring consistency. And I need that and I want that. And maybe that's you for this year. Then sign up for discipleship and help you grow in your relationship with Jesus. Okay, that's delighting in God's word. The second influence we want to have here, he says this. And on his law, he meditates day and night. He meditates day and night. This is a command. In Joshua 1.8, it says we should not... Uh, depart from God's word coming away from us, but we shall meditate on it day and night. This is a command, which means it's not gonna be natural for you or I to meditate on God's word. It's gonna take work. It's gonna take focus. It's gonna take challenge, but we have to meditate upon God's word. Well, you say, well, how long should I meditate on it? It says day and night. So it starts in the morning and it ends in the evening. It is this 24-hour idea where we are meditating and we're talking about it. Now, there are two major themes that you see throughout the book of Psalm that this idea of meditation comes up. And this word meditation is talked about a ton in these 150 Psalms. But there's two common things. The first one is this, to think about or to ponder. So when it comes to meditating, it's talking about to think about it, to to meditate upon it, to fill your mind with it. Eastern religion calls you to empty your mind. But here God's word says, fill your mind with my word. Like Eastern religion says, empty your mind. And the problem with that is when you empty your mind, you're giving the enemy a playground to come in and bring in self-doubt, insecurity, doubting your relationship with God. And yet if you fill your mind with God's word, if you meditate upon his character, you meditate upon his words, it gives very little ground for the enemy to come in and have a playground day all over in your mind. So you're called to meditate upon it. You're called to think about it. You're called to speak about it. So here's some practical, easier ways to help you meditate upon God's word this year. One, look for a promise. If there's a promise in God's word, look for that promise and hold on to that promise. So as you're walking through a book of the Bible, as you're walking through a chapter, is there a promise that you can hold on to? Because those promises are going to help you endure and persevere when you don't feel like it, when you don't desire it, but it's going to be something you continue to do. I think of the promise that says, do not grow weary while doing good, for in due season you will reap the harvest. So should you give up? Should you throw in the towel with God's word? No, you should persevere. You should endure. Because in due season, in the future, at some point, he doesn't promise when, you are going to reap that harvest. I think of this one, uh, look for an example. Here's another practical one. Look for an example in scripture that you can learn from. What I love about the scriptures is it's not this highlight reel of all the best things that ever happened in every man and woman. It gives you their highest of highs and their really, really lows. Look at the life of Noah. I mean, Noah goes down as one of the greatest men in the scriptures 
And God gives him this vision to build a boat. He's never seen a boat before. But God gives him a vision to build a boat, a big boat, that he can have two of every livestock and every type of plant, and he can bring his family onto that boat because they're going to live there for a while. And he says, because, and the reason they're going to build a boat is because God is going to cover the whole world in water. They've never seen rain before. Imagine that, but God gives him a vision for that. God gives him a passion for that. And he begins to build this boat. And over 400 years of building this boat, he preaches repentance and causing people to come back into relationship with God. I mean, that's a highlight reel right there because it actually all comes to pass. But right after that, like a chapter later, maybe two chapters later, Noah decides to let loose a little bit and starts drinking a lot and he gets passed out drunk to the point he's naked laying down. Now, why drunk people want to get naked, I do not know. But that is what he does. And his sons walk backwards and cover him up to cover up his shame. Now, that is a really, really low in Noah's life. And it's in the scriptures. So what we can see from this example is we can learn from Noah in this sense that when God gives us a vision or a passion for something, and we are called to be faithful to it, no matter how crazy it is, whether it's build a boat and you've never seen rain and you don't even know what a boat looks like, But you can also learn from the negative example that, yeah, drinking too much is probably going to end just like it did for Noah. And so I should probably learn from that and not adapt to that in my lifestyle. There's also exhortations. Exhortations are places in scripture that are exhorting you to move forward, to to join the game, to get off the bench. Exhortations kind of uh, are this encouragement to move forward. They're not as strong as a command, but there's this temptation to move into a relationship with God to a greater degree. There's commands to follow. God gives commands because he desires for us to be in this world, but look differently. And sometimes that command is going to push us forward in a relationship with him. I think of a command like, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. I think of a command that says, Don't just be a hearer of God's word, but be a doer of God's word. That one of the greatest temptations we have in a very intellectual city like ours is that we become intellectual Christians. And when we become only intellectual Christians and we land in this department of, I'm just going to hear God's word. I've heard this before. I know this. The challenge is, are you living this? And as I've overseen discipleship at Ecclesia for 12 years, 13 years, something like that, and seen hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people go through discipleship, the biggest challenge I'm always leaving people with is don't settle for intellectually knowing God's word. Are they living God's word? Because living God's word is attractive to an unbeliever. Intellectually knowing God's word is where hypocrisy comes in And who we think we are and who we actually are, there's a big chasm in between, and that's called hypocrisy. And we want to narrow that gap as a Jesus follower because it becomes more and more attractive towards us seeking and following him. So there's commands that we can live. Look for a prayer to pray. Sometimes we don't know what to pray. We don't know how to talk to God, but there are prayers that we can hold on to. Look at the book of Psalms and constantly pray those prayers to help us focus in on who God is and what he is all about and what his plans and purposes are. And so these are really simple, easy things to help you think about God's word and talk about God's word. The second major theme that you see meditation used in the book of Psalms is regurgitate. Now, the Old Testament is written in a very picturesque language called the Hebrew language. Sometimes those pictures are painted in a way that you love and they can stick in your mind and you're like, the glory of God, wow, a beautiful sunset or a beautiful sunrise. And we want those pictures in our minds. Other times they give pictures like this, regurgitate. This is not a great taste left in your mouth. This is not a picture that you wish would be stuck, but all of us have those pictures, as I say the word regurgitate, stuck in our minds. And this idea of meditation is to chew the cud. So you think of a goat who chews the cud, who will swallow their food, chew it up, swallow it. It will go into their stomach. They will regurgitate it. They will chew it some more. Then they'll swallow it, and it goes into their second stomach. And then they'll regurgitate it again. Then they'll chew it up. 
and they'll swallow it, and they'll regurgitate it into their next stomach, and that continues to go. I don't remember how many stomachs goats have, so you can look that up and Google that later. But this is the picture of what we are to do with meditation. Because you see, here's two fun facts about goats. Goats chew their cud eight hours a day. What if we focused in on meditating on God's word for eight hours? What if it was something that we regurgitated throughout our day, that we read something in the morning or we read something the night before and we think about it, we regurgitated in the morning and then around the middle of the day and then around lunchtime and in the afternoon and in the evening. What if we started regurgitating God's word? Imagine, chances are most of us, the things we regurgitate are our anxieties and our worries. We're worried about the economy of our personal finances and the reality of inflation and the difficulty of that or how much money we just spent over the holidays. We're worried about that or we're worried about some of the fractured relationships that are going on that either Christmas and New Year's kind of revealed in our family or uh, that were caused during that time in our family. And those are the things that we meditate on for six, eight hours a day. But what if we started meditating upon God's word and regurgitating it and chewing that cud? And that became the focal point of what filled our minds. The second one, second fun fact about a goat uh, that regurgitates its food is you can tell how healthy a goat is by how well they chew their cud. So somebody studied that. (laughs) Somebody did. (laughs) I did not study that. I read that, and I go, somebody's got way too much time on their hands to study that type of detail. But what if this began to be the measure by which we measured maturity? Or what if this becomes the measure by which we measure uh, growing in our relationship with Christ? We're maturing. Is how well are we meditating? How well are we regurgitating God's word? How much are we bringing it up into our minds? That if this began to be the focal point that we started thinking about, meditating upon the promises, the examples, the exhortations, the commands, and the prayers, what if those things begin to think, things that we meditate and we regurgitate on, what if those are the things that are our priority? Those are the things we're focused in on. Imagine what maturity would look like in our families, in our workplaces, in our homes, and even in our church. Imagine the things that we wouldn't have to deal with anymore. Because these were the focal points. These were the things. And I realize that we are conditioned in this culture and this day and age that our attention span is getting shorter and shorter and shorter. But what if we fought against that? What if we went against the grain and we made this year living out the command of Joshua 1.8 that we should meditate upon God's word day and night? Imagine the maturity and the growth and the development that would take place there. So we should allow these influences of delighting in God's word and meditating. And he ends with this picture in uh, verse three. He says this, Psalm one. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season and its leaf does not wither. Here's the illustration he starts giving of God's influence in our life. When we allow God's word to be that influence. He says, we're a tree planted by streams of water. We're we're a people that... um, This tree in that day and age would be right next to an irrigation canal. And that irrigation canal, when the waters would come, the tree would be able to extract from its root systems the water. And so that it would be able to deepen its roots. It would be able to strengthen its roots and the roots would be able to spread out. It would be able to build strong trunks and strong branches that would be able to bear the fruit and the the, weather, the storms that it would face. These were the things that the pictures that he's painting here at this time. And this was the most important part of that tree was the root systems. And it was being connected to the streams of water. The most important parts of our root system is our relationship with Christ and the spiritual rhythms that form and shape them. So by us delighting in God's word, by us meditating upon God's word, um, uh, uh, by us avoiding some of these walking, standing, sitting that's talked about in verse one, these things begin to form and shape our lives in a way that strengthens our relationship with God and begins to move us forward in a way that helps us to understand who God is to a greater degree. And it helps us get through the most difficult times of that. 
But notice what he says. He says it bears fruit in its season. Doesn't say it's going to be immediate. And he doesn't say that every season is going to bear fruit. Now, I love peach trees. And eight, nine years ago, I discovered a great best kept secret in Eugene, actually out in Harrisburg, called Dietering Orchards. And you could go out there in the end of June and all the way up to end of September, and you could go pick peaches, and you could enjoy these juicy fruit. And about four years ago, I planted four peach trees at my house. Two early season, two late season. Now, I planted them in January, and by February, guess what? They didn't produce any fruit. Matter of fact, that whole next year, I learned how much work those suckers take and how much time is being devoted to those four trees. Because not only in January do you plant them, and then you've got to prune them, and then you've got to spray them in the spring, and then you've got to pick off all the leaf curl in the late spring, and then year two comes around, and you do the same thing all over, and guess how much fruit you got in year two? None. So you do it all over again. And actually, in, at the beginning, end of year two, you see like these two or three little tiny peaches and you pull them off because why? You want the nutrients to be devoted and the energy to be devoted to the root system and the branches so you have strong stocks. Year three, we do all this work again. We get 15 peaches. I'm like, this sucker better start producing. <laughs> By year four, we get 200 so then we're eating them in the we're eating them for breakfast, we're eating them in smoothies, we're eating them. We have so many peaches for the next six weeks that we don't know what to do with them. And my kids are like, Dad, can we have a different type of fruit? Nope, we are eating these suckers right now. But too many of us, too many of us think we're like the beginning stage of this stock of a peach tree that we come to Christ and we expect the next month that we're producing fruit. But God's got to do a lot of work in us. He's got to prune us. Sometimes he's got to spray us to protect us from some of the disease that's out there so that we can be trees planted by heavy streams. So that we can allow the root systems to develop, that we can have some strong branches that are able to produce a lot of fruit. I remember Steve and I were recently having this conversation. If you don't know who Steve is, he's the lead pastor of this church and you're going to see him a lot up here. But, we were having this conversation just a couple weeks ago that we had some years of pruning. 2020 and 2021 at Ecclesia were major years of pruning of our church. We were like, there was so much turmoil, so much difficulty, and yet we were like, let's just stay faithful to the values God has given us. Let's stay faithful to teaching God's word. Let's continue to do this. 2022 rolls around. We watched 76 people declare their faith in Jesus and get baptized. <laughs> But it took two years of persevering, being pruned, being sprayed, so to speak, and allowing God's word to do its work so that it could have a fruitful year like 2022. And there is nothing more joyous than watching people publicly declare their faith in Jesus. Because that means they recently came to Christ or they're willing to take the next step in their relationship with Christ. And I'm not saying that 2020 and 2021 didn't have some fruit, but to a greater degree, you saw that. And so if you're like, why am I not bearing fruit? You got to do the work of allowing God's word to prune you, God's people to prune you and help you so that you could bear fruit in a greater degree in a greater season. Okay? So devote yourself to God's word. Make this a normal practice. If you don't know where to start, we develop reading plans every single year. And they are out at our connect table and you can pick them up. We pick one to two books every single month for you to read that you could understand in a personal development, a personal rhythm for your life. And guess what January we picked? Revelation. That way you're personally reading God's word. And we're, I, I can guarantee this, we're not going to finish Revelation in four weeks. Okay probably going to be like 20, 23, 24 weeks, something like that. But this will give you a greater understanding of where we're headed and what we're doing. And if you pick this up and you start this and you start strong, and the next thing you know is like a couple months in, you forget or you stop reading, you can always pick up in another book in a month that you've forgotten. 
And so I encourage you to pick up one of these reading plans. I encourage you to pick one of these up on your way out and make this a normal rhythm and a normal practice uh, for you in your life, in your family's life. Last thing I want to talk about is parents, read your Bibles to your kids. Make this a regular routine. Barna came out with this statistic a couple years ago that I will never forget. And in my duration of a life of a pastor and being a parent myself just sobers me up every time. Fewer than one out of every 10 born-again family read their Bibles together in a typical week. One in 10. Think about all of the different things that are influencing our kids' life. Think of all of them. And if only one in 10 of us are spending time in a weekly type thing, whether that's with grandparents or parents, reading God's word. And we're growing up in a day and age where there are so many resources so many. So I'm going to give you a few of them. There's the biggest story Bible ABCs for toddlers, where once a week you could go through that. Uh, there's Jesus Saves for the Gospel for Toddlers, which is a great resource for uh, a little bit later toddlers or early elementary. The Big Picture Bible, the Jesus Story Bible, these are all great resources available. Uh, they recently just came out with the Big Picture Story Bible, like the complete one, where it's for like late elementary school where it's like the size of a normal Bible. There's a newer Bible uh, company out there called Kaleidoscope that's for late elementary school where they can read on their own and they can develop these own habits, but maybe an NIV is a little bit too advanced for them. And so Kaleidoscope has created some great translations for kids and books of the Bible so that they can read them on their own and get into the normal rhythm from a young age and make that a habit and make that a practice. So let's make that a practice. Whether you're an adult and you don't know where to go and you don't have a reading plan, start with this. If you're a parent, do this and bring into your rhythm reading your Bible to your kids, whether daily or make that a weekly practice. And let's allow God's word to have a positive influence in our lives. So all of a sudden next year, we're not like these fish going, what's water? What's habits? What's forming us? What's shaping us? And let's make sure that God's word is the center of that. Amen? Let's pray.